Hello everyone, I hope you're all, all doing super well. Today we'll be talking about inflammatory and genetic liver disorders. Now, I will preface this by saying that this is not super high yield, so I'll try to keep this as concise as possible with just one slide per disease. So nice and simple, we should be done really quick. Introduction, so these are the conditions we will be touching upon. Um, these won't really be logical kind of reasoning based questions that you see on exams for these topics. It's mostly pattern identification and just knowing what disease is going to present with what buzzwords, right? Um, so let's just talk about what all of these have in common um, so, because I don't want to talk about the same presentation and symptoms with each one. So let's just think what's happening here. So what's happening with an autoimmune process? So what's affected and how would this present? Okay, any autoimmune process, you know, is going to be inherently inflammatory, right? So you end up with hepatic inflammation. Over time, once your hepatocytes are, in, are inflamed and get attacked time and time again, they are going to have a reduced function. And then you're also going to have destruction of the hepatocytes and the biliary transport systems, which drain bile. So those are the three points. And those three things will guide how most of these present. So let's start with, so we have each one of those. So when you have hepatic inflammation, how would that present? That would present with quite non-specific stuff. So fatigue, reduced appetite, fever, weight loss, abdo pain. And these will be the first symptoms you would see for every single one of these conditions that we will be talking about today. Because these are non-specific, it's really hard to pinpoint and identify these conditions early on, which is really, really important because some of them can cause irreversible damage. The next thing is after enough damage, you would have reduced function of your hepatocytes. And that goes back to our age-old question about what, do, what does the liver actually do? So first, we're going to have not enough bile being produced, poor digestion of fats that can present with steatorrhea, pale stools. You would have reduced production of albumin, among other proteins. So it would cause edema that's non-gravitational, unlike heart failure, which presents with gravitational edema. You would have reduced clotting factors being produced. So higher INR or an increased bleeding risk. And then you would have also higher levels of, of serum urea because you won't be able to metabolize it well, presenting with symptoms like an itch or asterisks or your flapping tremor. These are, again, as not super specific. Um, however, if you have these, it probably indicates that you have a degree of cirrhosis and reduced function because purely inflammation would not present this way. If you have reduced function, it's probably a later indicator. And finally, when you have the destruction of hepatocytes and you have bile leaking out of your system, you're going to also present with jaundice. Starting off with autoimmune hepatitis. So there are two types of autoimmune hepatitis. You don't need to know anything about these. The only thing that you need to know is the antibodies that autoimmune hepatitis presents with, because that will be on your exam. The one that's important to know is the anti-smooth muscle antibody that's commonly seen in type 1 AIH, which is more common in adults. That's all you need to know. So autoimmune hepatitis, ANA positive, anti-smooth muscle antibody, and would present with all of these features. LFTs would be deranged expectedly, and the pattern would be hepatocellular. Again, no surprises there. And the confirmatory test of choice is going to be a liver biopsy. Quite often, we know we get asked, what's the first investigation you do? What's the confirmatory investigation? What's the best investigation? So I've put those in for each one of these conditions. So your go-to best confirmatory test for autoimmune hepatitis is going to be a liver biopsy. Treatment is twofold. First, you want to induce remission. Um, and basically start them on high dose immunosuppressive therapies. You don't need to know the exact regimens, but just know we can use a wide range of agents. Most commonly we use steroids like prednisone as a thioprin, and then we can also use second line agents like mycophenolate, mofetil, and tacrolimus. Once we do induce remission and we have kind of a more long-term um, treatment plan, we would start them on maintenance therapy that's usually lower dose prednisone or as a thioprin. Now, how would we actually monitor the disease activity would be by measuring and looking at all of these features, right? So assessing, do they have signs of hepatic or systemic inflammation? 
what is the liver function looking like? And when I say liver function, I don't mean the LFTs per se, but more so the productive function of the liver. And then you can also look at things like your LFTs, your enzyme levels, the levels of bilirubin, which are all predictors of that degree of inflammation. Next, we have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And, well, you just don't produce this enzyme called alpha-1 antitrypsin. What does alpha-1 antitrypsin do? It basically prevents cells from breaking down by this enzyme called neutrophil elastase. Not relevant, but it answers a question that I had in third year that I didn't know the answer to until this year. So I'm sure you know that alpha-1 antitrypsin is one of those conditions that presents with multi-system involvement predominantly being your liver and your lungs. So your liver, which is you, which is meant to produce this enzyme called alpha-1 antitrypsin, can't do this anymore. Um, and you end up with hepatocellular breakdown because you have accumulation of this enzyme's pregenitor, so the enzyme right before this enzyme in the hepatocytes, and that's toxic, so it causes hepatocyte breakdown. And the best test for that is a liver biopsy. But an area in your body where you really need this alpha-1 antitrypsin enzyme is your, is your lungs. So within your pulmonary parenchyma, you need high levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin to prevent its breakdown. And when you don't have that, you have breakdown of all your, um, of the parenchyma that's uh, global. And therefore you present with panacinar emphysema which means pan meaning all around, a senar meaning a sinai, which are your kind of end organ, um, sorry, end of your respiratory tract, um, alveolar kind of chambers, right? And it's going to be pan meaning all around it versus smoking induced emphysema um, that is more central, which means it doesn't affect all of the, all of the sinai um, as consistently. And the best test to assess for that is a CT of the chest. It is diagnosed by measuring the serum antitrypsin protein levels. You can also do electrophoresis. The treatment is mostly conservative because you can't, like it's, a, it's an enzyme issue where you don't have enough enzyme, right? So if it's severe enough and there's a threshold, like if your serum antitrypsin is below a certain level, you can actually replace that. But in most cases, it's conservative until their liver starts failing in which case we then go for a liver transplant. Now, a liver transplant is curative because the liver that you do in plant has a normal production capacity for this alpha-1 antitrypsin. Next, we have Wilson's disease. Again, pretty buzzwordy. You basically have an issue with the gene and it prevents the proper binding of copper to proteins. Now, if there's anything we know about blood proteins and all these metals, is that as long as they're bound to a protein, it's okay, right? The issue arises when we have an issue. So we, we get issues with copper when it can't bind to proteins well. When it can't bind to proteins, we end up with high serum levels or circulatory levels of copper. And it's this free copper that is free to deposit, right? If the, pro, if the copper is bound to proteins, it's okay. The first place this does tend to deposit is the liver. And only once it's saturated and you already have signs of hepatitis and liver cirrhosis does it follow on by depositing in other sites. The two main ones you need to know are your brain and the eyes. So in the eyes, it presents with this really pretty looking ring of copper around the iris. And that's called a Kaiser fascia ring. I'm sure it's one you've heard of. Um, it can be a bit hard to diagnose in pain patients with um, brown eyes or non-colorful eyes. Um, but a triad of Wilson's disease you need to know is liver cirrhosis, Parkinsonism, and dementia in a young patient. So if you have any, if you have three of these, always consider Wilson's disease. How do you diagnose it? We have low levels of this protein called seroplasmin. What seroplasm, seroplasmin does is it binds, it's that protein that binds to the copper. And therefore by low levels of seroplasmin, which is the issue, we end up with high free serum copper. Oh, that makes sense. So we have low protein, which is the gene issue that leads to high free serum copper. You also have higher levels of copper excretion, and this can be assessed through a 24-hour urine collection. 
a slit lab exam is a good first line test to do. Um, and obviously we'd be looking for these kinds of fascia rings. If everything else is inconclusive, you can do a liver biopsy and follow this up with genetic testing for reproductive purposes. The treatment is a low copper diet. So avoiding things like nuts, um, meat, shellfish, seafood, um, and also starting them on chelating agents like penicillamine, not to be confused with penicillin. Uh, I remember thinking penicillamine sounds like an antibiotic. It is not an antibiotic. Um, it's used to chelate or chelate copper or bind to copper to help excrete it. Lastly, we have hemochromatosis, which is again a genetic or gene defect that causes increased intestinal iron absorption. So what's happening here is there is meant to be a nice protein that controls how much iron you absorb. When you have this gene defect, you lose that control and you just end up absorbing heaps and heaps of iron. What happens then is your body can't cope with this increased level. So you end up with high levels of iron in your bloodstream. And then that goes and deposits in places we don't want it to go. The most commonly affected organ is the liver. Again, why, why is the liver the most commonly affected organ in all of these kind of conditions? Well, when the issue is that of increased levels of whether it's iron or copper, the place that comes from is the gut, right? And you know, with your portal system of circulation, the first site that's going to be kind of the, the first uh, toll before it reaches the rest of your body is going to be your liver, that first pass metabolism. And so that's where it's going to deposit the first. Other sites include the pancreas, which can cause diabetes, skin that causes a bronzing or bronzed appearance, joints that can present with arthralgia, heart, cardiomyopathies, and pituitary deposits causing hypogonadism. The three that are bolded here are the ones you need to know. So diabetes, bronzing, and arthralgia. That is your most common exam question. And it's also the reason why hemochromatosis is called bronze diabetes. The diagnosis is based on looking at your iron studies. So you'd have high levels of serum ferritin. You would have reduced total iron binding capacity. So what is this? It is basically how much your um, body is trying to bind to the iron. So if you're iron overloaded, you're going to try and reduce the iron binding capacity. You also have an increased transferrin saturation. So what's basically happening, the way I think about it, the transferrin is the one that's binding to the iron and transporting it all over, all across your body. And obviously that is going to be high. So most of your transferrin is going to be bound to iron, which is what the saturation is. Again, if everything else is inconclusive, you can do a liver biopsy and stain for iron. You can also do genetic testing and you would like to do an echocardiogram at some point to assess for the degree of cardiomyopathy, depositions, and also check for heart failure and arrhythmias, which are the common cardiac manifestations of hemochromatosis. In terms of treatment, it's a bit tricky to manage because unlike copper that can be excreted through the urine, iron cannot be excreted in, like your body can't excrete iron. The only way to excrete iron is if you are um, a woman through menstrual cycles, right? Um, and therefore the threshold for treating women who are um, menstruating is a bit different. But the broad principle is you would be undergoing therapeutic phlebotomies or just drawing out blood, donating blood. And if that's not enough, uh, you can often use chelating agents like deferoxamine, which can again bind to that free high level of circulating iron and help excrete it that way. Um, I hope that all made sense. Thank you for your time. And please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.